Hello, everybody. Dr. Nick here with another exciting episode of The Hospitality Spirit. My guest today is ZJ Tong. ZJ grew up in China and came to the United States 20 years ago to pursue his graduate studies. He started his career as a group leader for American groups traveling in China, and later became Director of Tourism Marketing for K Jewelers. He is now the owner of China Pro Marketing Partners, a tourism marketing agency focused on helping destinations, attractions, and shopping centers outreach to the inbound and domestic Chinese market. ZJ, thanks for being on the podcast today. Thank you for inviting me. So ZJ, we always like to start with the present. Uh, and then work our way backwards and see where our journey takes us. So, why don't you start off maybe telling us a little bit more about um, China Pro Marketing Partners, uh, your role in that, and why you saw the need to start that company? Um, it's a little bit long story, but I'll make it short. Um, I was working as director of marketing for Signet Jewelers, which mm. uh, owns K, Jared, and Zales mm. as their director of tourism marketing. And I left the company a few years back and uh, started the China Pro Marketing Partners uh, with some industry colleagues who needed help uh, with Chinese inbound Chinese tourists outreach because um, for quite a while, Chinese are the fastest growing uh, in inbound tourist group uh, for the whole country, and they spend a lot of money mm -hmm. uh, in our, you know, attractions and shopping centers and stores. Um, so I set up the company to meet that need, and it has grown fairly well until, of course, you know, last year. Mm -hmm. So since last year, we still have a few clients who continue to en engage our service, uh, and we started turning our directions to domestic Chinese uh, market. Uh, in the meantime, we also decided that since we are waiting for the market uh, inbound market to return, uh, why don't we continue to engage our audience, which are the inbound tourists, through um, social media. And uh, we decided to build ourselves as a social media influencer. So since last June, we've been uh, developing vlogs uh, in China's social media spaces, like Chinese version of TikTok, Douyin, mm -hmm. or WeChat channel, which mm -hmm. is a new video sharing channel. And uh, just in the past few months, I also started doing live streaming, and the account really uh, launched or kicked off after I started long, uh, live streaming. So now we have collectively maybe 40,000 followers. And on one particular channel, which is WeChat channel uh, video sharing site, uh, we uh, grew 10,000 followers within the last month. So wow. we're definitely on a very fast growing uh, streak. Yeah, someone who's uh, lived in Asia and traveled extensively throughout China. I, I'm not sure it's it's very difficult to quantify the presence of WeChat to somebody that has never used it or just people here in the United States. Uh, WeChat is probably one of the most commonly used uh, platforms in China. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, but it is truly remarkable. And essentially what it is, you have the ability to message people, you have the ability to transfer money back and forth through uh, the cashless pay feature. Um, you can create groups, uh, businesses will create WeChat channels. Uh, you travel throughout China extensively and everywhere you go, there's a QR code, <laughs> it seems, <laughs> exactly. um, where you can do that. And I mean, I remember even in business settings, uh, when I would sit down for the obligatory six, seven hour dinner, um, one of the first things you would do is you would exchange QR codes uh, mm -hmm. for WeChat accounts. It um, Business cards were important, but it seemed like the WeChat QR code was almost equally as important um, as a way to, to engage. I even use WeChat with when I'm teaching international students or classes focused primarily on international students, I'll create WeChat groups for them there. Um, mm -hmm. it, it truly is an incredibly powerful platform, and it seems like you've you've really hit on something to really embrace that as a mechanism to to drive tourism. Yeah, we used to hire uh, in China. We call them KOLs, uh, key opinion leaders, uh, mm -hmm. which we call them 
influencers or bloggers here in the U.S. Uh, we used to hire KOLs, uh, even celebrities from China, to help promote our client destinations or shopping centers. So um, this past year, since we have some uh, time on our hands, so we decided to develop ourselves as that influencer. And WeChat, since you know, we m kind of missed the opportunity of fast growing with Douyin, which is Chinese equivalent to TikTok. Mm -hmm. uh, but WeChat channel as a video sharing site only started um, January 2020. Mm -hmm. um, so we are jumping on it very fast. Uh, I believe we are the uh, uh, leading uh, accounts in the United States that is focusing on travel. Uh, so I know that I've talked to some other people who started travel accounts and they all looked at my account and saying, you know, we, we learned so much from you. So we're glad that, uh, you know, we're taking the opportunity uh, of a downtime into developing a department developing ourselves or invest into ourselves, which after a whole year of work, now it's finally not paying off per se, but we are growing very fast. So as soon as the market returns, I think we are much better positioned to help our clients. Okay. And uh, we are also adding one more skills and one more uh, revenue uh, channel for ourselves as well. So you're here in Chicago, um, but it sounds like you're, are you primarily focused on, on kind of driving tourism to, to this market or are you looking at other markets in the United States? The, you mean the tourism from China to the yeah, US? The inbound, yeah. Inbound, yes. Yeah. Uh, so yes, we primarily focused on uh, inbound tourists from China to the U.S. Mm -hmm. That's many of our clients hired us for. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the reasons for that is uh, I work with many destinations and shopping centers, and they said, you know, we can handle European markets ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we even know, you know, we've worked in the Canadian markets or uh, Mexican markets or Latin American market for quite a few years. But when we come to Chinese market, we really get lost and we don't know where to start and we have we don't know much about wechat or weibo and a lot of other uh, social media platforms and plus there's language and cultural barriers uh, so with my uh, background uh, working in cooperation and uh, background uh, knowing both chinese and american culture uh, both corporate and just day-to-day uh, -day culture so i I was positioned very well to be that bridge uh, in between American destinations and shopping centers with uh, inbound Chinese markets. Uh, but I always also believe in local Chinese communities because mm -hmm. um, I always call them our uh, ambassadors because when you have international travelers coming to say Chicago and uh, people will ask your friends or family who come visit will ask where should I go and uh, I'll give you an example uh, Art Institute of Chicago is our client and uh, for almost eight years now I think more than eight years. And uh, when we did the first tour guide and tour operator training at the museum, we asked about 20 or 25 uh, tour operators and uh, guides from Chicago, Chinese speaking guides. Uh, how many of you have been inside the museum? You know, we only saw half hands, half mm -hmm. of them have their hands up. So how can we expect them to promote you when they haven't even been inside of your museum. So that's what we do is uh, in addition to, you know, in the Chinese social media space in China or doing sales calls and sales mission or road, road shows in China, uh, we also try to work with local influencers, lo working with uh, local media uh, and try to educate the locals about the specifics of our destinations and shopping centers so that um, they can be our best ambassador. When somebody asks them, oh, you're from Chicago, where should I go? Mm -hmm. um, they Now they will say, you know, definitely Art Institute, definitely, you know, museum campus and stuff like that. Sure. And they probably will also, if there's a less visited uh, location, uh, if we have uh, marketed to them and uh, now they know about it and chances for you to be included in the recommendation will be much higher. So besides the the technical proficiency of the social media platforms. What are some of the other kind of cultural differences that really, when you go to a client, 
you identify that you can help um, the client understand or that would differentiate them from European or tourists from from other areas? I mean, what are what are some of those those habits, best practices that that you really have noticed throughout your extensive experience? I think a lot of times uh, because we've had uh, international tourists for many years. And um, so when we think of Chinese market, a lot of times we assume that uh, we can reach to this market uh, the same way that we reach to the other market. Uh, but the Chinese market is, is such a unique market because, you know, some governmental restrictions uh, mm -hmm. in China, uh, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, uh, Twitter, and all of these channels are actually not available. Yeah, they're, so they're you behind a firewall. Behind the great wall. The great wall. The great firewall. Great, great firewall. So you have to really develop a uh, channel into channels that Chinese use, as we talked about WeChat, which has over 1 billion active monthly active users mm -hmm. um that's you know mind-boggling number and other channels that are coming up very quickly weibo which is all even older than wechat and in recent years uh red which used to be called little red book mm -hmm. uh, and of course douyin uh, chinese equivalent to uh, TikTok are also very popular. And now WeChat channel as a new video sharing and all of these takes number one uh, somebody who actually knows the language um, mm -hmm. to help you set it up. And number two is also the content that you develop on it uh, needs to be very culturally sensitive mm -hmm. and also uh, contents that are to the Chinese interest. Because, you know, sometimes we think, oh, this is, there's so much history of this attraction and this and that. And the Chinese might be interested in certain aspect of that uh, mm -hmm. attraction, not all that we traditionally um, you know, understand about uh, the international markets. Chinese might be interested in um, uh, more shopping than mm -hmm. uh, than museums uh, that happens in the past. Uh, and so it really, we need to, uh, my company ended up becoming a, uh, you know, it's really a, a full service agency uh, to help develop content as well as to help uh, do travel trade outreach because many of the Chinese travelers still travel uh, with the help of tour operators, either back in China or receptive operators here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but but my perception is, again, is traveling throughout China, staying in hotels and eating in restaurants. It seems like the, the cultural differences exist really in virtually every segment of hospitality and tourism. The, the hotel experience, there are very different expectations about what's in a room and the layout of the room. There's very different expectations about dining. Um, there's different expectations about retail. There's different expectations about, about lots of different things. And so really what intrigues me about your services are you really don't say I'm only focused on the the museums are only on the shopping that you, you will help anybody. You'll help restaurants, you'll help retailers, you'll help hotels um, because that holistic tourism and hospitality ecosystem um, can benefit significantly from marketing to that inbound Chinese market. Uh, absolutely. I, I think I remember uh, quite a few years back when we first started like a um, China ready uh, programs, the Hilton, actually has a program called Hilton Huanying program. Mm -hmm. Huanying literally means welcome. Mm -hmm. uh, so in we, I believe I translated the very first version of their um, Huanying program, which included like in-room uh, kettles and slippers mm -hmm. and then Chinese menu for breakfast, uh, Chinese newspapers and Chinese channels on TV. So many of these uh, will make your Chinese guests feel much more welcome and comfortable when they come to travel. And uh, definitely when you go to a attraction such as Art Institute of Chicago, uh, previously people come through the museum, they would walk through the museum in an hour 
and very quickly and come out and you ask them, how is the museum? They said, oh, it's really nice. And then, what did you see? I don't remember. I don't yeah. know. They've, um, they've checked the box of that they visited. <laughs> yes, yes. So, um, but uh, since we have developed the Weibo and WeChat, a lot of contents, uh, seven years worth of content, seven or eight years, depending on the channel, uh, um, the, the people if they really wanted to learn about the museum, we have so much more to offer for them. I remember actually, I did not meet him in person, but uh, he visited his uh, uh, high up executive every year. He spent uh, three days uh, flying from China to Art Institute of Chicago mm -hmm. and just sit there and paintings after paintings and just sit there enjoying them. And he went through our Weibo and started chatting with my staff and uh, asking questions. Eventually, we introduced him to meet with uh, the curator and also directors of marketing at the museum, and they made friends. Uh, this person, you know, he really wanted to learn, and uh, he ended up just, you know, taking advantage of the content that we developed. So we're so happy that people are using these contents and then become so much more um, equipped in explaining what they have seen and uh, also sharing their knowledge to others. Mm -hmm. My perception and my reality of having quite a lot of friends coming um, from China to the U.S. is that to your point about rushing through the Art Institute earlier, when my friends and colleagues come over from China, they want to see lots of different cities, that it's not as common for them just to come to the U.S. and just visit Chicago, mm -hmm. um, that they're going to go to Chicago, they're going to go to Detroit, they've got to see Niagara Falls, they want to go to New York City, they want to see lots of different things, whereas a Western traveler um, might just basically use one destination and just stay there for a week. Um, is, is that what you've kind of seen or is my perception totally off the mark? I think Chinese tourist market really went through uh, several phases and we saw a large number of Chinese tourists coming to the U.S. only about 10 years ago when the U.S. and China signed a MOU to mm -hmm. welcome Chinese tourists to the U.S. And uh, at the beginning, uh, we see a lot of group travels and a lot of first-time travelers to the U.S. Uh, so when the first-time travelers come into the U.S., they uh, demonstrated exactly the same uh, attitude, uh, attitude as you mentioned. They wanted to cover as many uh, destinations and they wanted to check all the boxes mm -hmm. and they'll have been there and done that. Um, you used to have an expression that would say, you know, up on the bus and off of the bus, take picture and back on the bus, <laughs> that type of thing. <laughs> and uh, we also have an expression that, you know, the uh, getting rid of illiteracy of American destinations. That, that's, mm. you know, it's hard to explain translate that term, but basically people wanted to go to as many places on their first trip as possible. Uh, and so that's why at the beginning, 70% of the Chinese travelers are group travelers. Mm -hmm. And in recent years, even prior to the pandemic, we already already saw the, the trend is changing into much more FIT, free mm -hmm. independent travelers, uh, meaning many of the people who would travel on their own or they would travel in a small group, such as a family or two family or a few friends as a small, small groups travel mm -hmm. together. And um, so uh, I would imagine that trend will continue after uh, return of the international travel uh, because people definitely don't want to be in a big bus uh, sure. as much as they used to anymore. Well, it's interesting because uh, that's, that's a very similar pattern than we saw here in the U.S. I mean, for the most part, the, the dependence on travel agencies here in the U.S. has decreased significantly. Um, that, that, but that's just an evolution of the business. And now as consumers become much more confident, um, they have much greater access to information, whether it's uh, online, online travel agencies or booking sites, and they can do everything themselves. So there's not that reliance. And I think a lot of those Chinese travelers early on, the, the, the idea of traveling to the U.S., for lack of a better term, seemed so foreign and they didn't understand the nuances of it. So there really was a place for those travel agencies. And 
even traveling domestic domestically around China, um, there was still a heavy reliance on travel agencies to help book book the rail or book the air in the hotel. Um, but it's nice to see that the confidence is growing in um, the Chinese, 1.6 billion plus, to really kind of fall into that FIT category. Because when that happens, what you start to get is a greater distribution of travelers to not necessarily just stay in the big cities, that they start going to the smaller markets, they start going to more rural places, um, and it starts the coverage of inbound tourists to the U.S. starts to grow significantly. Yeah, absolutely. When I went to trade shows in China, and uh, tour operators all ask me, do, "What kind of products you have that is different?" Uh, you know, the traditional twelve-day, uh, five cities type of uh, model doesn't work, uh, or is not a, a, as appealing anymore to the more sophisticated returning travelers. And many of these returning travelers are the ones who have more money than, uh, you know, somebody who would travel to the U.S. for just once mm -hmm. and in their lifetime. And then that's why they have to cover as many cities as possible. But we see more and more returning travelers who are back and uh, they definitely wanted to spend a lot more time, uh, a lot more in-depth uh, discovery or exploration into a destination. Um, and as you mentioned, the tour operators continue to play a big role in helping channel these uh, travelers to different places. Uh, and uh, there are also uh, quite a few uh, OTA online travel agencies, uh, similar to Expedia and Bookings, uh, uh, com. These type of uh, websites are all supply, supplying a lot of content uh, mm -hmm. to travelers so that they can do research. Chinese really, before their travel, usually they started planning at least three months ahead of the time or sometimes sure. even half a year ahead of the time. They started reading online and started checking or uh, asking for recommendations and things like that. And one of the reasons why uh, we started doing the video blog and also live streaming is also in China, we have a word called zhong uh, cao, which mm -hmm. literally means planting the seed mm -hmm. or seeding uh, for, uh, for income. Uh, incoming travelers. So as they are not able to travel, uh, many of them still have travel in their mind. Um, so we want uh, the U.S. not to be, you know, out of sight, out of mind. We wanted to continue to engage many of these travelers. So by uh, supplying uh, video contents, which I tr truly believe uh, video marketing will be the next big thing for the Chinese market or for any market uh, in, in that sense. Uh, 5G is here and mm -hmm. uh, uh, the bandwidth uh, will enable people to do a lot more video and also a lot more live streaming uh, uh, as content. Uh, so we, we try to uh, go, we continue to work with, we will continue to work with the tour operators, but in the meantime, one of one of the purpose for us to develop ourselves as an influencer is uh, we as a marketing agency eventually wanted a channel that we can talk to our uh, customers or our clients customers directly mm -hmm. uh, so that we can learn their need their interest and we can also influence their decisions of travel it's interesting that concept of kind of planting the seed and the word of mouth it it also applies to academia. Mm -hmm. um, quite a lot of our international students, when you ask them, why did you choose DePaul? Um, they inevitably say, I was on a message forum talking to my friends, they recommended you. Um, and that word of mouth is so powerful um, that there's almost a, you're almost given credibility um, when someone speaks very highly of you and it's a trusted source that you're hearing that from so that's that's interesting to hear that it's also translates into the tourism market absolutely <laughs> yeah. what um i'm curious and i've got a couple of questions here what in terms of in terms of the biggest inbound markets for someplace like chicago is it are we mainly looking at the tier one cities the beijing shanghai guangzhou's are you looking kind of at 
other s- cities, I mean, I think there's a common misconception that a city like Chongqing with 25 million people is small. It's massive. <laughs> <laughs> um, or, you know, Chengdu or Kunming. I mean, these are millions and millions of people. It's far bigger than Chicago. Um, but not a lot of people in Chicago have ever heard of these cities. Um, where are we seeing most of the inbound travelers come from? Is it spread out across China or is it really in those tier one cities? Because that's where the nonstop flights are coming out of. Yeah. So when we market in China, we work primarily, currently primarily focused on uh, several major cities, mm-hmm. uh, Shanghai, Beijing, uh, Chengdu plus Chongqing mm-hmm. and Guangzhou plus Shenzhen. Mm-hmm. Uh, so these are kind of a four destinations. One of the reasons for that is because these four major what do you call a uh, source market or source uh, mm-hmm. cities uh, are will gather the travelers from like within two, three hours of, sure. tr- of travel uh, time to and them. Come in so, on a train or uh, connect they, the flights. Yeah. yeah, they congregate all many of the neighboring uh, provinces or cities mm-hmm. travelers. So we and the tour operators in these sort of a gateway uh, cities uh, still play a very key role in designing the product mm-hmm. of travel and in arranging the travel. Uh, so that's why as marketing agency, um, I know that some marketing agencies have offices in uh, all four destinations mm-hmm. where uh, my office has one office in Shanghai uh, as well. So uh, prior to the pandemic, uh, we use that office to reach two uh, neighboring states in Shanghai, as well as you know, when we need, we travel to to Beijing to do mm-hmm. uh, to to sales calls and to meet with clients, to meet with media, uh, things like that. Yeah, I think, and it's many people wouldn't necessarily remember this, but several years ago, I mean, there was one point when Choose Chicago, which is the travel and tourism entity that promotes Chicago as a destination, they had four different offices yes. um, in the mainland, which is it's. It's interesting to think about, but that's how important this market is uh, for Chicago. I mean, I think there was a point pre-pandemic, maybe five, six years ago, when we were looking at about 400,000 inbound tourists from China coming to Chicago, Um, multiple nonstop flights to Beijing or Shanghai, um, multiple airlines. I mean, this was a... um, And I think will be, obviously, after we, we come out of the pandemic, will be one of the most robust markets that every hospitality organization in Chicago should be focused on. Uh, totally agree. Um, I think Chicago is an example. Another example is Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, actually, during the pandemic, uh, Los Angeles did not, they actually laid or furloughed quite a few uh, of their own staff in the mm-hmm. LA headquarter office. Mm-hmm. I believe I heard like 70% of the staff were laid off mm-hmm. where in China, they kept all the, all of their offices mm-hmm. and brought all of them in full capacity in, in May. Mm-hmm. Um, so that just shows um, how important uh, the China market is for gateway cities like LA uh, for, for their tourism. Mm-hmm. And, um, you mentioned about a lot of Chinese coming to Chicago. Uh, Chicago is uh, n- not even on the top five destinations for Chinese travelers. Mm-hmm. However, I think Chicago as a destination for returning travelers uh, has a huge potential because mm-hmm. as we promote Chicago, we always say Chicago is the real America. It's the heartland of America. Sure. Um, it's the heart of America. So uh, when people have traveled to the East Coast and West Coast, and uh, they wanted to learn more in depth of American culture, and we always recommend people to come, you know, come to Chicago. And from Chicago, I used to represent my company, is the official China rap agency for Great Lakes USA, Mm -hmm. which is an organization promotes six states in the whole region. Uh, And the uh, tourism director of the six states are the board of directors of this organization. So just from Chicago, you really can branching out to, you know, uh, the beautiful Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, Indiana, Ohio, uh, Minnesota, and of course, so much more in Illinois. Um, so there's uh, definitely we have a, a huge potential here. Is there 
with the the Chinese inbound market, is there a is there a seasonality component to to when the demand uh, goes up significantly? I mean, is it Spring Festival? Is it you know or Chinese New Year? I mean, when is it all year round? I mean, do they follow the same travel patterns as Western tourists might? The Chinese travelers uh, most of the year follow similar uh, uh, travel patterns. However, there would be a couple of hikes mm -hmm. that is uh, counter season mm -hmm. uh, uh, travel peak peak travel seasons. For example, in China, we have a large uh, uh, fest uh, a couple of uh, festivals that people tend to travel. One mm -hmm. of them is called Golden Week, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, you, now usually is eight day vacation time uh, started from October 1st. So that during that period, you're going to see a large number of Chinese travelers overseas. Mm -hmm. And then of course, Chinese New Year usually falls in the end of January or beginning of February, which is a very slow season for majority of the US destinations. Mm -hmm. And uh, but that is actually a peak travel period for Chinese sure. travelers. Uh, so we, yeah, we recommend people to take advantage of that. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because I, you know, one of the things that always amazed me and I didn't fully appreciate it until I lived in Asia and traveled throughout China was how significant Chinese New Year is. I mean, the sheer volume of people that travel during that time. And it always amazed me that something really simple that a hotel could do is to really capitalize on that, to capitalize on the significance. This is a, for generations and generations and generations, um, people don't realize how young we are here in the United States. If you've ever studied Chinese history, you realize how um, old China is, that Chinese New Year has always been a peak time for people to experience leisure. And it always amazed me that there wasn't a greater emphasis on promoting that in hospitality industry here in the U.S. to really try to capitalize on that. Yeah, I think uh, Choose Chicago really does a very good job mm -hmm, every do. year during the Chinese New Year time and make it a opportunity uh, to market to China. So mm -hmm. they uh, highlight some of the Chinese uh, celebrations and activities and also educate the locals about the Chinese New Year. And in the past, pre prior to the pandemic, uh, we always had some large performances from China mm -hmm. during the uh, Chinese New Year time also. And all of these went on national news in mm -hmm. China. So it's a great exposure uh, during the t that time for Chicago. I yeah. think uh, Chicago definitely did a great job in that. And for many of the uh, uh, destinations here, uh, you know, Chinese New Year is a time, number one, we will have travelers from China sure. to want to visit. Number two, uh, when we show interest in Chinese culture, in their tradition, uh, they take notice mm -hmm. and they uh, really appreciate that. And they, they feel much more closer and more uh, feels much more welcome and friend, uh, you know, your friendship will be, uh, recognized by the Chinese and uh, in their decisions of where to travel to. It's interesting. Someone gave me some advice when I first started traveling to China about meeting people for the first time. And, and they really impressed upon me the importance of building relationships and relationships are paramount. It is, um, it is how you build credibility. It is how things often get done. And someone gave me some great advice one time and they said, one of the ways to immediately start to lay the foundation for a good relationship is to show an interest in history and culture and the, the things that bring people together to celebrate. And it worked. I mean, it's um, traveling throughout China, there is such a sense of pride in everything that the country has done um, and still is doing today in terms of innovation. And it's a remarkable thing to embrace and to learn about. It's an endless project. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you will never know everything there is to know about Chinese history. It's kind of, you know, pick a date range and take a deep dive um, yeah. and study. And, and also China, you know, talking about reverse um, uh, marketing or reverse market, um, 
the we have so many Americans who have traveled to China as well, mm -hmm. or even lived there or studied there. Uh, so China is such a huge country. So when we usually travel, we would go to Beijing, Shanghai, maybe the uh, Chengdu and some of the major cities. Mm -hmm. And but the more uh, the, the the next time when you travel back to China, it, chances are you wanted to see something more in depth, and you go to. Uh, little towns. Mm -hmm. I had a friend. I have a friend who studied Chinese in China. Instead of going to the big cities, he went to Fuzhou, uh, mm -hmm. which is a city. Uh, he went there somewhere like 12, 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are not many Ch uh, English speaking people in mm -hmm. the or foreigners in that city. So he ended up speaking one of the best Chinese I, mm -hmm. uh, as, a, an, as an American who can. Uh, command a language, and he speak one of the best Chinese I have seen. Uh, and the local people loved him, and uh, you know, really took him in as mm -hmm. uh, somebody who, you know, appreciate their culture and uh, decided, you know, even as the lone American in that city, mm -hmm. and he would go to uh, experience what the locals would experience. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because I would see my experience is exactly that. I mean, you. You summarized it perfectly. My first two or three trips, it was mainly going into Shanghai and Beijing and kind of looking at a couple hour travel bubble around that. But after several years, really, it was just Shanghai and Beijing. That's where I arrive, stay the night, next day, get on a plane and go someplace else. And if I was going to go back to China today, it would be, you know, either move west south or north as quickly as possible. So still, I think one of my favorite places to visit was uh, in Western China, Lijiang, uh, mm -hmm. Dali, um, absolutely gorgeous. I mean, to, to think in your head about what Dali is like, think about, if you're listening to this, think about Switzerland, mountains, mm -hmm. beautiful lakes, it's lush. If you go up to Lijiang, the, the snow-capped mountains, absolutely beautiful. If you want to experience something like you've never done before, go to Liaoning province up to like Shenyang up in the north and experience what it's like to be very cold close to the Russian border. Um, every, every province, every city brings different food, different traditions, um, just immensely different cultures that the, the complexity of it. If you want to experience something totally different, go to a place like Guizhou and understand kind of the the cultural history with some of the minorities and it's just it is such a diverse country to travel to um that going to beijing and shanghai is very similar to going to a chicago new york la it's a big city it has everything that the big city would have um, but if you really want to understand what makes it unique get out of those big cities and see and it's incredibly easy now with multiple, you know, dozens and dozens of different airlines, but really the access to high speed rail. Uh, we don't fully appreciate how powerful 300 kilometer an hour high speed rail is um, to get places throughout that country. And the speed in which that high speed rail has become the gold standard and how people travel is you, you have truly set the benchmark um, for other countries. Yeah, I remember, uh, you know, I've been in the U.S. for uh, 20 uh, plus years. So when I first, in the uh, first few years when I went back to China, I still have to fight to get into the train mm -hmm. and it was slow. A slow train. A slow train. <laughs> slow train. Yeah, Four people I, to a cabin on bunk beds. <laughs> and, and there's people don't follow the rules and you have to really elbow each other and to mm -hmm. get on the train so that you can get the seats are not assigned. Mm -hmm. You have to really mm -hmm. fight your way to get a seat uh, for a, say, four or five hour train ride. But um, quickly it develops the fast uh, fast rail uh, and uh, you go to from uh, Shanghai to Beijing in what five hours mm -hmm. uh, so that just unbelievable how yeah. things changed over the past few years uh, and that and that experience is I, I don't think people also fully appreciate you know in the United States when we need to fly gosh what is it up to now two three hours before the flight leaves you gotta you gotta be there and then you gotta go through security and then you gotta queue up and by boarding zone and 
you know, there'd be times in high speed rail where 20 minutes before the departure of the train, you jump off at the front of the station, you got your ticket, grab a Starbucks, walk right down the escalator and your train's right there. I mean, yeah. it, it, you have an assigned seat and it's incredibly luxurious, particularly in those premium cabins on that high speed rail. Right. Um, and it's smooth and you, you blink your eyes, so you're from Nanjing to Shanghai. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. And, and one thing for fast rail is you can walk around mm -hmm. uh, so much more freely. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, my mom doesn't like uh, air flights, mm -hmm. uh, fly by air. So uh, when I was in China, uh, traveling with her, I would take her on, you know, the premium cabin and in, in the fast train. And mm -hmm. she enjoys that very much. And we can travel together mm -hmm. uh, to different places. Yeah. One of my favorite memories, um, I was traveling with a group of people on the high speed rail and we had that premium cabin kind of in the front of one of the, one of the rail cars. And there were five, four or five seats in the cabin alone. And we brought food on the train with us, very easy to do. And we just kind of sat on the floor and had a picnic. <laughs> and, and it was, and you know, the countryside is going by at 300 kilometers per hour and you're sitting there and it's clean, it's comfortable, great clean bathrooms, uh, great service from the, from the attendants. Um, and your luggage is right there. So when you reach your destination, just grab your luggage and walk off. Yep. Yeah, I miss that. <laughs> I miss that too. So as we kind of wrap up, ZJ, this is this has been a really fun conversation. What advice do you have? Just maybe one or two pieces of advice for besides pick up the phone and call you. Um, what pieces of advice do you have for businesses here in Chicago, uh, in the Midwest, even in the U.S. Um, about things they can do very very quickly to start marketing themselves to that inbound Chinese market? I think number one is uh, don't write Chinese market off. Uh, mm -hmm. And because of the pandemic last year, um, I, I do know, and also because of the previous administration really put uh, a lot of damage to the Sino-US relations. Um, so, uh, so some of the destinations are hesitant and wasn't sure where the government is leading uh, toward working with China. Mm -hmm. uh, however, uh, just knowing uh, the sentiments between uh, between these two countries, um, they were so intertwined. The two countries are so intertwined with each other, um, economically, particularly economically. Um, there, we really can't can't have a, like a, the word divorce just like that and mm -hmm. just separate or isolate from each other. Uh, we will continue to see large number of Chinese travelers wanting to come to the U.S. One example is um, the, this year, we are not going to see a lot of international travelers back to the U.S. However, uh, a lot of Chinese students who are going to uh, higher education like DePaul uh, mm -hmm. institutions uh, will come back. And uh, most recently, the number I saw was in in May, Chinese consular offices issued 23,000 visas to Chinese students. That's in great. June, they issued 33,000. Yeah. And a large number will actually apply for their visas in July and August. And in many so, cases, their parents will come over to visit them. They'll bring them. There's a tourism aspect to that as well. Yeah, many many of the parents, uh, if they haven't been to the U.S., it might be difficult for them to apply for a new visa. However, a lot of the Chinese already have their visas, which uh, are valid for a few years, mm -hmm. uh, as long as the um, uh, uh, there is a it goes into details, but mm -hmm. there is a way that you can travel. Uh, they cannot travel directly from China to the U.S. at the moment, but many uh, parents I know that will travel to Singapore and spend 14-day mm -hmm. quarantine True. in Singapore and then fly to the True. U.S., where the students can fly directly from China to the U.S. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, among the rep agencies uh, that represent U.S. destinations, our estimate is about 150,000 Chinese students will come back to the U.S. for the fall semester. Um, so that is a very significant number, you know, particularly considering that we are 
um, not having a lot of international market. The border is not open uh, pretty much. And many of these students are spending, you know, fifty, sixty thousand, up to eighty thousand dollars a year、mm-hmm. uh, to study here. You know, I was just back from、uh, New York, and I did live streaming at New- NYU as well as Columbia University. And previously, I've done live streaming at University of Chicago, DePaul, and you know, Northwestern. And the tuition is quite expensive,、sure. and, uh, and the cost of living、uh, are quite expensive、uh, in the cities like Chicago and New York. So these students who came, they are not my generation of students who came twenty、mm-hmm. years ago, and、um, you know we were poor at the time. And now many of these students who came, they pay their own way, and they have money. Their、mm-hmm. family have money. So how to? Reach to this market and make them、uh, aware of your destinations, your product, your services、uh, will actually pay off.、Uh, so, I agree. Yeah. So basically, my recommendation is create a Chinese market strategy,、mm-hmm. uh, both for you know in the short term for the Chinese student、uh, market as well as、uh, local and domestic Chinese, and then in the long term. Um, still, once the market or the border is open,、uh, the Chinese will come back. I hear that a lot on my live streaming. People are just saying, you know, so thank you so much for showing us the U.S.、Um, live streaming. We can't wait to go back. I agree, and I think one of the things that I would agree with you. One of the things that I've missed most about the pandemic in my personal life was the, the travel aspect and the ability to. Not only go visit other cultures, but also to welcome other cultures here,、mm-hmm. and to really show what it means to exhibit the, for lack of a better term, the hospitality spirit in、mm-hmm. in what we do.、Um, so I'm excited,、uh, ZJ. This has been a wonderful conversation. I always enjoy talking to people that are、uh, passionate about what they do.、Um, But are doing what they do for also a greater good、um, to create this sense of, of promotion of travel, but also promotion of welcoming and acceptance of other cultures.、Um, it's always、uh, it inspires me、uh, to do great things.、Um, so thank you for being a guest on the Hospitality Spirit today. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me to be on your show. I really enjoyed it as well. Thank you so much. <laughs>